I hope you can hear me. Please write in the comments so I know because this is the first time for me to go live in YouTube. So I hope it goes fine and um, we will have a really nice conversation. I have prepared also some of the questions that you published uh, under my previous videos about PhD in Norway. So I will uh, talk about them, but also I would like uh, in real time to get your questions in the chat. So uh, we could try to make it as a communication and uh, that you could actually take some beneficial answers with you today. I will hold this live session only for one hour. I hope that it will be enough. Uh, if you will not have enough questions to talk for one hour, then uh, it means that we will finish a bit earlier. So again, uh, please let me know if you can hear me. Yes, great, super. Then uh, you can start writing your uh, questions in the chat. I can see uh, what you're writing in the chat. So this is cool. And I will just uh, slowly introduce again myself and why I talk on this topic. So last year in April 2020, uh, I myself has graduated from Norwegian University of Science and Technology. I received my PhD in the field of additive manufacturing uh, with a special focus on machine learning for quality assurance. So I went through master studies in uh, Norway. And after that, I worked in our university as a research assistant. And, that I, and then I got my PhD for four years, where I was 75% of the time I was doing my PhD. And 25% of the time I was actually teaching and helping with different duties for it. Uh, actually, yes, the first question is about, it's not a fellowship, so it is a salary. PhD in Norway, it is a job. You will be getting a salary. You will have uh, official uh, 25 days of the vacation uh, after the first year of working. You will be paying taxes. And every single year, your salary will be increasing by uh, some specific uh, amount of money, depends on the inflation. And also, I would recommend you, uh, as soon as you start your PhD, uh, to be a part of the union. I, I myself, I'm a part of the Tecna union that was negotiating my salary every single year. So I was getting an increase in salary without uh, being worried about that at all. And um, I think that if, for example, you will be living in a small town, at least uh, even I think for Trondheim, it should be okay. Uh, your salary should be fine for two persons if you will be clever in having a small apartment, maybe not in the center of the city. Uh, if you could, um, if for example, in Jovic, you don't need to pay money for the transportation if you walk. This is what I actually did uh, when I moved to Jovic. I was walking quite a lot from, I think it's possible like 40 minutes, uh, one hour maximum, you can get from one side of Jovic to another one. So it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, so the salary for two should be enough for life, especially also you can be smart with buying uh, food in the stores. You can buy the cheaper versions and not going as often out to it. So I think it should be fine. But there is also regulations uh, when you move to Norway, if you want to come with your uh, for example, wife or girlfriend or husband, you actually will need to get a separate visa for that person and you need to show that you have enough money to support that person. And this is what is regulated by UDI and is changed yearly depending on the amount of money that they think it's uh, enough for you to have. So that's why quite often you will, uh, if you're moving to Norway uh, as I did, you will need to check UDI pages quite often for searching for the information and contacting them if you have questions because every single case is very special and what I've seen myself on the Facebook groups when people ask some advices everyone gives completely different responses even though they had a similar situation so that's why 
the most appropriate way is actually contacting UDI and just getting information directly from them, especially in the email, because then you can use this email as a supportive uh, document in case of uh, any issues. Uh, I didn't say that uh, I have a question about uh, Norwegian courses. I didn't say that my university has paid for my Norwegian course. Uh, in our in, in the university and in you at least you can have uh, a separate course that is uh, I think it is provided it's like online course it is provided for anyone for free and also if uh, you're interested you actually can apply for the regular course in Norwegian as a as a typical like 10 credits course which you go uh, and I think this one will be for free for you if you are part of the university and then for instance if it's um, depending if it's a master level co course uh, it could be just required for you to pay uh, I think it's about 500 Norwegian kroners um, it's not it's kind of like a fee but every master student pays them but you will get then a student card that actually you can use then to buy a cheaper, like I think Pepe's Pizza has discounts. You will get discounts for the train tickets uh, to travel around Norway. And you can get discounts for the taxi, uh, discounts for different different things in Norway. So actually to have this uh, master's student card, it's also quite beneficial uh, for yourself if you want to save money, especially if you live in a big city. Uh, but uh, for myself, uh, I learned Norwegian practically at home uh, because when you live in Norway, you can have a TV, you can watch quite a lot uh, uh, on the, because we also have a different like Netflix uh, uh, via play and so on where you can find Norwegian TV shows, you can uh, watch them there. For instance, on viaplay.no, you can also have uh, access to the three Norwegian channels where you can watch a different Norwegian TV shows just to practice or like to, or to get more uh, exercising on the language. And the mainly, I would recommend just to try to talk to anyone, uh, like your colleagues, uh, people who sit around you. Uh, especially in university, it should be quite easy and uh, people are not always but more often understandable that you need to practice and they if you say that you want to be if they can help you maybe to correct you a bit uh if you say directly to norwegians they will do it if you don't ask for it uh, it's a small percentage of the people who will do who will do this by themselves uh, but i would say practice a lot and i uh, just read a lot of newspapers uh, books uh, i also bought for myself uh, just the regular grammatic uh, books that uh, i went through by myself and only once i paid myself for the norwegian course and uh, that for me it was a bit of waste of time because and money i wanted i had a not as good group my group was everyone who worked in norway and they spoke norwegian uh, every single day and what they wanted they wanted uh, to improve their grammar and I actually had this point cover at home because I had enough time to sit and work on my grammar, but I needed someone kind of to push me to talk more. So, and then it was a confusion for me because in my group, uh, the most of the time we spent uh, on the lessons, actually completing homework that I did at home. So at some point I just stopped going there and uh, for me, I wasted money on that. So that's why I believe that you still can learn Norwegian at home and practice a lot, but not every person would agree with me on that. So that's why uh, in the university, I would recommend if you want to, uh, you need to ask, you have uh, administrator, like uh, you have a PhD responsible person uh, at administration at your uh, department you can go and ask and talk to them uh, if they know anything about that if no just uh, search Norwegian course on and uh, on the your university web page and see what is there you can also search just in google the uh, Norwegian course uh, in the university and see which university has but for instance Antonio they have like a starting uh, some starting conversation uh, things uh, that they actually made it kind of free, just a web-based solution that anyone everywhere in the world can use it. So you don't need to be even here to do that. 
for the PhD, uh, it should be enough a proficient English. Uh, I myself, I cannot say that I'm completely fluent in English. Uh, it would be, uh, uh, I would lie because I originally come from Ukraine. So I speak Ukrainian, Russian, uh, English and Norwegian. So uh, you need to have a proficient English that is at the level that you will be able to write articles to publish them. And uh, you would be able to communicate uh, your research and your findings to other people in the way that they will understand it. So that's why I think it's more like proficient level. Uh, it is enough. And you also can find on each university, not each university, but I think in most of the universities, you will find that when it's a PhD description, they try to put also requirements to the PhD, like uh, what is the English minimal level that is needed. And it can read from the university to university in Norway. And it also even uh, from some PhD, uh, I think I have seen like different requirements within one uh, university. It just depends which department uh, published the PhD position. So that's why uh, I read carefully uh, vacant, vacant positions and see what they require. So this is like the most critical part when you apply for PhD. PhD is a job. So you need to treat it in the same way as you would apply for a job because you are applying for a job and you will get a visa that is working visa. And after three years of your PhD in Norway, you will actually get a possibility for applying for permanent residence permit and then keep living in Norway and building your life in Norway. And if you receive a four year PhD, uh, where you, as I did, you will need 25% uh, to teach or like to help assist in teaching, then actually you secure for yourself a permanent residence permit for sure. So that's why I think like using PhD as a starting point to move to Norway, uh, it's kind of a great point for if you go, if you have a possibility to start as a master student, it's even greater because then you start building connections inside the country beforehand. Okay, let's see what else. Uh, GPAs. Uh, uh, during your PhD application, you don't need to know Norwegian if it's not specified. So most likely uh, in most of the Norwegian, in the PhDs, you, it's not required to know uh, Norwegian. It is required to know English. I think the only, uh, the only one direction that I can think of that could want to have a PhD in Norwegian, it is in medical uh, field because uh, at least in Jovik, we have the whole department that is specializing in the medical directions and everyone who is uh, working there and teach there, they do it in Norwegian only. So that's why I think like when we talk about medical direction, then you need to know Norwegian at a high level. Uh, anybody from any country can apply for PhD in Norway. The only, uh, I think in one of the videos before, I mentioned that actually uh, if you've been rejected for one PhD position, it shouldn't stop you applying for next positions that are available because there could be many reasons why you were rejected. It doesn't mean that uh, you would, you you cannot get it. It just can be that it was too many applicants and uh, it, it was only one position, maybe 15, 20 people uh, trying to get it. So it doesn't mean that you are bad. It just uh, maybe you had a bit less luck or someone else was a slightly, slightly, slightly had something uh, that was like on top. Uh, it also could be that in some of the PhD positions, if they're inside of the project, they are funded because there is uh, two ways how PhDs in Norway are funded inside the university. One of them, it is when it's a part of the project. And then there could, depending on the companies that are involved in the project, there could be limitations to some of the countries. Uh, so it's the same for me with some of the country, with some of the companies uh, here in Norway. I cannot work because I come from Ukraine, and Ukraine it's now war. So I'm not allowed to work with them. So it's okay. Don't take it personally. This is can happen. So that's why I would recommend you to apply, keep applying until you get it. So for example, my friend, she spent around a year for getting a PhD position in Norway. So 
but she really wanted to move to Norway. So she uh, just was searching for the PhD positions in Norway and keep applying. So sometimes it takes a long time, uh, but if you really want to move to Norway, then just go for it. Uh, what I meant, um, actually, in the PhD in Norway, yeah, when I talked about Norwegian course, uh, since I didn't take any Norwegian courses in the university, I don't know on which level they are. So that's why I try to cover kind of, I don't know, in, in university, we have bachelor level, master level, and PhD level courses. So, for instance, for instance, if you're a PhD student, it doesn't mean that you cannot take a master level course. In addition, every PhD um, candidate in a region university has to take 30 credits, from which 10 credits can be a master level course. But there, since you are not a student and you are employee, in order to go together with master students on the master level course, you need to pay a fee. So in that case, if you take a master level course, yes, you will be taking a course together with different master students. But it doesn't mean that you're required. As I explained in Norwegian, it just, uh, uh, I, this question I was not prepared for, so I am yeah, not quite sure yet, but uh, I'm sure that it's not hard to check. Every description of the course, at least in my university, it stays the level. Uh, which level at each which level it is so then you can get an understanding also don't forget that each department uh, has a person that is responsible for helping phd students and also in your group you will have some phd representative sort of that you can ask questions and uh, your body that you can ask questions and they should help you out if you don't have it propose to have it at your department. We had it at our department and it was really helpful. Um, when it comes to the GPA, I, I know that I received many questions about GPA and this is you also need to understand. When uh, you apply, it's not associate professors who are checking your GPAs. For this, we have a special uh, organization in Norway. It's called nocute.no. Uh, at NOCUT organization, they check um, every applicant, like every university, either they, ha they have a specific person who is responsible for checking the documents and then maybe sending out your uh, master uh, uh, documents, uh, master degrees to the NOCUT so they can uh, say what is equivalent education in Norway. So how your education is equivalent to the one to Norway. Uh, I also found, not in my university, but another university and on some of the videos I actually published the result and link to it, where they explained how they treat GPA from different countries, how they make them equivalent to Norwegian grades. But also for you to understand, for instance, uh, American and Indian GPAs, they have a completely different way of uh, being translated into Norwegian uh, grades. So that's why uh, I don't cover it. I don't know the details behind how they do it. And typically, associate professors who are on the interviews with the person and make uh, kind of and look on the documents, we don't touch this part. So this is what we don't know, and um, it's uh, we are just getting uh, it from the external people help on that. So that's why for me, like GPA part, I will be honest, it's a bit hard. I tried to found, and I found only one university that uh, published the, this information online and on some of the videos uh, I shared the link to, to one of the comments. So please go and check it. it should be somewhere there. Um, but if you have a B, um, this is like what is very critical in Norway, you need to have a B or A for your master thesis and also your average. But it doesn't mean that if you have a C, you shouldn't try, you can try. 
uh, maybe you will be the only one who applied for this PhD and then you don't have anyone to compete with and maybe some university or some department will be able to kind of close their eyes on that and uh, because you have some other strong parts. But for instance, one, uh, I know that um, one of our master's students who finished our master that I also finished, um, he tried uh, for half a year, I think, to get a PhD in Norway and he was rejected because he had a C on his master degree, like his master thesis. And now he actually almost uh, finishing a PhD in uh, Netherlands. So it doesn't mean that uh, there is no any way to get a PhD. Maybe if it's not as easy to do it in Norway, just uh, select another country as well. Uh, for the PhD, um, which which country or university, uh, which city or university I recommend for PhD? I would say that in Norway, yeah, fairly any university is good. So I cannot say that I have experienced or I, I have heard about some universities that they are not good. So um, I personally come from the largest uh, university in Norway, and that is NTNU, Norwegian uh, University of Science and Technology, but there is also many, many different uh, universities and depends actually what is your field of study. Select the university uh, that has a program for your field of study because this could be. I think NTNU will be quite competitive, so many people would apply for it. So you also could select some universities that uh, are on the northern part of country because it could be that it less people who applies there because there they have half of the year winter or like half of the year nights and half of the year days that is not easy for anyone to live in so it could be challenging but it could be less competitive to apply there The research experience, it is um, important, but it's not critical. So if you have it, it's good. If you don't have it, uh, it's okay. I think that the grades would uh, play a more critical role uh, when you apply for a PhD and also your practical experience. So for, for instance, you have finished your master and then you worked a bit and then you can apply for PhD. So then actually your experience from the work would be really valuable. What I also learned lately that actually uh, it also was on the one of the um, comments under my videos that what if you have uh, your master's in one field of study and you want to do a PhD in data science, I would recommend you to make a shift a bit uh, softer. Uh, you, I wouldn't recommend you to try to apply for a, a pure data science PhD. I would rather recommend you to take uh, as your like your master degree as a base and then apply for something where you can mix it up um, with data science, where you can apply data science. So if you do experiments, how you can, uh, if you have a field of study, then you can do experiments. Uh, you can uh, start using data science for data analysis. So if you will do experiments, you will collect some data and then you can start using Python. Don't use Excel, just move to Python and try to do some uh, learning how to code in python and programming in python even if it uh, comes from the social science you still can do it you still can learn it is hard but you can start learning a bit a bit and in three four years you can get to the point where you can actually code um some so you can do some functions that will analyze uh, maybe your interview um answers from people uh, if they have this word in the sentences or something like that. So it's like be creative on that point and uh, you can succeed uh, in mixing different, different fields together. Which city is, uh, okay, I see one more be beforehand. If you have already published articles in uh, your graduate degrees, uh, yes, uh, please mention them in your CV. It would help uh, when you apply for PhD in Norway. How many interview rounds are there for PhD? It, it will be only one interview round. Uh, my, my PhD interview was, uh, I think it was, 
about 30, 45 minutes, but it was in Norwegian. My PhD position was uh, announced in Norwegian. I have applied like all my documents, my CV, my cover letter, everything was submitted in Norwegian and my interview was in Norwegian. If you want to know more about the interview questions, I have a separate video on my YouTube channel about PhD interview questions. Please look at that. I have explained quite a lot, even more than I did it myself. And also what I learned throughout these years of the PhD, just generally what is critical by being on the other side. Uh, recommendation letter. If you have a recommendation letter, then submit it. But anyway, uh, in addition to that, have uh, one or two persons more. Uh, Two, two or three actually, not one or two, two or three persons listed as uh, recommendation persons because, uh, of course, uh, our administration will, will take a look on the recommendation letter, but in addition, they will take a contact with uh, one or two persons from your list uh, just to make sure that uh, information that you are provided is uh, correct and there is nothing critical or hidden by you. The city that is warmer in Norway, I think it would be more like Stavanger, that is more to the south. But personally in Jovik, like today, we have uh, about plus 26 degrees Celsius. And uh, it's very, for those who come from Ukraine, or so I would say that it's very similar to Ukrainian weather. So like re in recent years, we actually have quite warm, uh, I would even say hot, summer that uh, typically it should rain more but it doesn't rain that much and we have kind of cold winter with snow um, but it's not uh, as bad as for example if you think about Bergen or Trondheim where it's very close to the water and you will get really a lot of wind uh, so you will perceive the temperature completely differently also is Oslo is also quite warm city uh, but in more general, I would say, like, if you really want to have a warm, warm uh, uh, city to live in, look on the university uh, in Agder. There are universities there and try to look more on the southern part of the country. Jovik is actually hidden, um, kind of, it's a perfect uh, place to live. I think, like, we have the largest uh, lake in Norway. Uh, here so it's a nice views and we are covered they're hidden by the mountains on the other side so we don't get that much wind and not that much rain so i would say it's really nice combination and day night uh, comparatively for norway is very good uh, distribution throughout the year so uh, as you see i moved to jovik and i live here already for eight years so i like it here Okay, let's move on. Um, scholarship for master thesis. Yes, this is for, for master degrees. This is uh, one of the topics that I actually plan to do in some future because it will require a lot of research for me and it means that I need to have a lot of free time to do that. But in reality, uh, for instance, uh, as I moved to Norway, it was my university in Ukraine had an agreement with the Norwegian, uh, at that time it was Høgskole Jovik, it was Jovik University College. So it was even not a large university, it was University College, a small one in a small uh, town. And we had a collaboration uh, specifically with this, uh, we have a master, uh, master degree in Master of Sustainable Manufacturing, um, SUMA. Uh, and we had specifically with this master agreement that we could uh, apply and get a scholarship. So in agreement, we had the one year scholarship, but I got a proposal for two year scholarship. And I think that the trick was that uh, I started learning Norwegian beforehand and I started my interview with Norwegians in Norwegian. Because when you apply for scholarship, most likely you will have an interview because it will be more people than available uh, play, like vacant places uh, to fill in. 
so uh, for sure all the time um, uh, we work uh, with collaboration with different universities we try to get funding uh, together so uh, check at your country check your universities uh, if uh, you have any mobility it could be like for six months exchange it could be up to year exchange uh, so uh, check it out at your university because to cover I think for me it would be really hard to cover all of the universities in Norway and how they collaborate all over the world so it's quite a lot but for you it would be much easier just to check universities in your country if they have any collaboration with uh, any Norwegian university or um, uh, community, uh, university college yeah sorry I sometimes I have only Norwegian words in my head I see that there is a question about uh, the mark sheets, degree certificates and diploma need to be certified for inter international students. So I remember what uh, what I remember. So when I was applying, you need to have a diploma. And if it's given to you in your uh, nat native language, so for me, it was in Ukrainian. I actually in Ukraine, um, I uh, translated it myself, but then we had a lawyer who kind of sealed it and uh, said that it corresponds to the original one. So typically you should have some uh, some places where someone does a translation and then call, collaborates or like work with some lawyer who will uh, put a stamp on it. So this is what you would need to do. If it's in English, then you don't need to do anything. You just uh, submit it as it is. So about GPA, I already explained uh, before. So I will, uh, it will be uh, this video available uh, afterwards. So please uh, go back to the beginning and see answer about that. Microbiology research was available in Norway. Yes, it's supposed to be available as in any other countries. We have a different universities with different departments who has a different fields of study. At least in Antenor, you should be able to find the majority of the typical uh, fields. Uh, I think including microbiology. If it's not at Antenor, there is uh, for sure some university in uh, Oslo or like in some other part that has this topic, I would recommend you just to use uh, keywords like microbiology uh, degree Norwegian University and then see what comes up. The PhD uh, requirements in finances, um, I would say it should be quite similar to any other PhD requirements. Because PhD, it is a job where we learn how to become a researcher. So typically in Norway, it's rec similar requirements to uh, every single PhD direction. It could be only uh, be a small additional requirements that are specific to the field of study. So for that, I would recommend you use jobnorge.no for searching. I have, in, I think, every single video about PhD um, on YouTube, in the description, you will find the links to different universities and where to find for a job. I have shared many of times, but Job Norge .no, it's a place where actually you can find uh, uh, almost every single PhD position that is open at this point published there. So it's a requirement. So that's why check it out there. To be a research assistant. Uh, a research assistant position is not open for from abroad, so you need to be uh, inside the university. You need to be a master student to be able to uh, get this uh, position or like to apply for this. Uh, research assistant, you can start applying uh, for that position. I think from the very beginning when you start uh, studying in the Norwegian University. So when I was a master student, I received my position. I, I was invited to become a teaching assistant. 
you know, this uh, also when you're a master student, you can work up to 20 hours per week. Uh, so this is the time in that I was uh, working. I started in December. So I came to Norway in August and in December, I already uh, received my first contract as a uh, teacher assistant. And then I just kept uh, working uh, with the same professor, like this, I helped to different professors in different courses. Uh, and I know that uh, many of my classmates, they actually did as a teaching assistants and they uh, help uh, students uh, from bachelor studies in math quite uh, often. It was like that. So typically all of this is published internally on the, uh, on the university uh, uh, sources that are available for students. We have internal uh, pages that are used for communication with the students and students uh, know about these positions there, but they are not listed um, to anyone else because it's a very, comparatively for Norway, it is a low paid, but for me, comparatively to Ukraine, it is a high paid job. So that's why yeah, they cannot publish it just uh, as a typical job because it's a small part-time job that is paid by hours sometimes it could be 20 hours sometimes it could be eight hours per week and that's whole so it depends also on the courses uh, projects and the tasks and people who are searching for the assistance as i explained phd salary uh, if you are smart should be enough for a couple to live in norway so if you don't waste too much money on going out. Uh, uh, also, is there any PhD in Antonio under any professor for ML and AI? As I explained also on one of the videos, um, uh, in American system, you need to contact the professor to get a PhD. In Norwegian system, it doesn't work like that. So in Norwegian system, we have uh, funding that comes from the faculty and we have funding that it comes from the projects. Uh, the funding that comes from the projects, uh, of course, you have a professor who wrote this um, proposal to get the funding, who will be searching for a PhD student, but uh, it's not going to help if you just send out um, emails to those professors that you will be invited to interview. It doesn't work like that. You, you just need to find the PhD position opened uh, officially on uh, university website or jobnorge.no and apply from there. This is a must rule for Norway. You have to do it like this. Uh, I haven't experienced myself anything else. So every single person that I met, they, they got the job in such way. Nothing else I know. I'm not aware of nothing else. So that's why I'm telling you. And um, nor in Norway, this is the system built in such way. Of course, if you're inside, you have a bit more they know you a bit better, but still you go throughout the whole the same process and as anyone else, and you compete with anyone else in the world, even though they know you. So it's kind of, you have to do it. And uh, if you want to do a PhD in machine learning or artificial intelligence, this is what I said. Um, if you want to do it in a pure level, then uh, look uh, for like it's not that many positions that are open for the pure one. I think it would be like maybe some mathematicians or a computer science department. But in most of the cases now, it's many different fields of studies that actually want to have um, that you know a basic uh, fundamental knowledge about the application field and some uh, knowledge about machine learning. So the same as I did, I had the knowledge about manufacturing uh, and uh, machine learning, and I combined them to do a PhD about editing manufacturing and machine learning. I know people who does this for building. I know people who does this for materials. Um, so many, for, for many different reasons, what you can do for image analysis, for construction, for many, many reasons. I don't recommend you to mail professors directly. It wouldn't help. Most likely when I receive such emails, I don't look at them. Uh, I don't, because I cannot help. If I have uh, some PG position, I have to list it as any other position. So that's why typically 
uh, I cannot help in any other way. Um, writing to me emails doesn't help me. Sometimes I feel really bad because I cannot help these students, even though they are good students. But if if there is no positions available, what can you do? Nothing. The unions, uh, the best, uh, I joined the, the best one. If you're a student, join them when you're a student. If you start in your PhD, join them as soon as you start your PhD. First of all, these unions, they will, uh, you will pay, when you're a PhD, you pay really little for the first three years. Uh, and uh, you will get uh, uh, help from the lawyers for free if you need it. If, for example, at your department, you have a situation that you don't feel comfortable and maybe you feel that someone behaves incorrectly towards you, you can also go to you, to a representative from the union in your university and talk to them and they will give you recommendations how to proceed further. So it's kind of not only about salary, the part that it is about but it's also to be a bit more protected and to have someone that can help you and explain in more details uh, regulations in Norway and maybe even help you uh, to, to be a bit more protected if in case because I cannot talk about every single department or university but we are all people and we're different and some people have it really hard during PhD while others have really nice uh, colleagues and supervisors but also there are some cases when supervisors and PhD candidates, and they cannot find the common language and then it is a hard life for both of them. Who knows, maybe in such cases, it's nice to go to union and to talk what would they recommend you to do. If you have, can, can you apply for a PhD when you're still doing your master's? If you have one more master before, yes. If you don't have one more master before, I don't recommend you because you need to have uh, your grade for a master thesis. If you don't have your grade for master thesis, no one will look at you. So that's why yeah, it doesn't help to apply for a PhD before you finished your master. After completing your PhD postdoc in Norway, you will be eligible for a professorship in any other country, I think, in the world. Uh, I'm quite sure even in the United States, as a, at least as assistant professor. So uh, it's a PhD in Norway. It is the same as a PhD in any other country. So that's why, yes, uh, if you finish uh, your PhD here, it should be fine to go and find a, a job in another country. No problems with that at all. Uh, at, at this moment, uh, as I've seen about open international borders at Norway, I've seen that our PhD students, they started coming half a year ago to Norway. So I think for them, uh, the borders were open. If you follow the regulations from the, um, in Norwegian, it's F, F -H -I .no. It's where we receive all the regulations. But as I understood that now actually Norway opens more and more. So it's a good news. And I know that our even our master students, um, they managed to get inside the Norway uh, when we had like those three weeks uh, opening in December, so they came. So yes, I think the PG students already can come to Norway. This is what I've seen uh, at our department. You will also be, uh, you will get the guidelines from the your contact persons and the department. Uh, so they will uh, guide you what to do and when you ca can come and move. So no worries on that. If you get a PhD in Norwegian University, uh, you will get the support from the university and they will help you to understand when you can enter and when you can't. Uh, about uh, getting a call to the interview after submitting PhD application, I can say you that it depends a lot on the uh, department and how many applicants there are. For instance, for now, I can say you honestly that July, it is a vacation time in Norwegian, in Norway, and especially in Norwegian University. So kind of the whole July, we are out, we don't work. And uh, that's why most likely, if you just applied in June uh, for the PhD, I'm so sorry <laughs> for you to say, but you will need to be waiting until the August when people will be back to at work and they will start processing. 
other than that, it could take uh, the whole PhD process, uh, like application for the PhD, uh, about maybe one or two months to be called for the interview. It could be a couple of weeks before you are called for the interview. And then after interview, it, it may take about uh, from one to three months to receive an answer. Uh, it also will depend on, on the, uh, because, for sure, for the interview, it will be called uh, at least two, three persons. So like top three typically are called for the interview from all of the. So that's why yeah, and typically we have a committee who is looking on the CVs and like all the documents. And then this committee has an internal meeting who is uh, discussing who should go further in the process. Afterwards, administration sends out uh, response to those who didn't go through and it also takes some time because we have inside the very bureaucratic process that needs to be filled so that's why it takes a bit of time for those who are going in the interview after interview the next steps will be that we need to contact the reference persons and sometimes uh, we can wait even for three four weeks to get response from those reference persons. So this may slow down the process. And after for all of those uh, top three candidates, we receive this information, then it's an additional internal discussion with the, inside the committee, uh, who should go further, uh, who should be hired, and uh, then the given result is sent to you. So that's why it's very hard to say specific this is the time that it's going to get. Uh, but uh, I know the cases uh, where it could go quite quickly. And in some cases, it can go a bit slower, especially if you get into the slot when it's uh, vacation time or in December when it's uh, Christmas time, where it's also like December. It's, it's very Christmassy and relaxing time uh, in Norway. So that's why yeah, you will need to wait longer if you got in these two parts like July or December. I know that the PhDs in America is quite different, but for instance, on my defense, my opponent was a professor from United States. And before graduating my PhD, I was invited as a visiting researcher in American University, USC. So I spent two months there and I still collaborate with one PhD who works in the, uh, who is a PhD in USC. So uh, I see the differences, but anyway, yeah, it's still a PhD degree, uh, it's equivalent in both countries. So that's why it's, it's not a problem. If you have masters in physics, and you want to to do masters in uh, computer deep learning it still will be two years yes most likely yes i had a master from ukrainian university and i did two years of master in norwegian university so i have two master degrees a friend of mine she has two masters from ukrainian university and she also did two years of master here in norway so to get the full master degree most likely yes How many PhD positions can you apply for at a time? As many as you wish. You also can, even if you've been selected, you can also reject in the end, uh, don't take the position. It's the same as job. You can apply for as many as you wish. For the PhD research, when you apply, uh, one of your interviewers will be your kind of your future supervisor uh, so and and then additionally two i think like additionally two three more persons from which one could be from administration and two other professors uh, just to make a process honest and uh, different people has different perception and we also not only look on the skills and cvs but we also look on the pers personality in general because you need to have this match between the supervision supervisor and a student to have a really good collaboration. Uh, I know um, that sometimes when you don't get it, it's from our other department uh, here in Jovic, 
um, that the student was forced, uh, like needed to change a supervisor because they couldn't collaborate uh, together at all. So it was a really stressful time for the PhD uh, and uh, there is a specific procedure for that. So that's why uh, you can even uh, on the interview, if you are interested, you can ask because in the end of the interview, you will be asked, uh, do you have any questions? So this is the place where you can ask who will be my supervisor and what are the points of the supervisor or whatever on the field and so on. So this is what you can do. Uh, to help you out to understand who is the person who may be your supervisor. You also can have a co-supervisors if there is a need to cover additional field of study where your supervisor is not a proficient at. For instance, for me, when I did the research in additive manufacturing, uh, we didn't have a professor in additive manufacturing uh, at all. So, but I, my the main supervisor was like proficient in general manufacturing. And then I had a close supervisors who were covering like different aspects that are related to IBT manufacturing. So this is how it's done. But most likely it's not your supervisor who is doing your PhD, it's you who are doing the research. And your supervisor is there for, to guide you. So you shouldn't be expecting that this person will tell you every single step what you need to do. So we want to see also proactive students who are eager to do uh, their PhD and not those who are sitting aside and just waiting to be told which article to read or what to do. A renewable energy sector is becoming more and more uh, popular. I know that we uh, at our department in Jovic, we have a bachelor in renewable energy sector. So I think in the coming years, uh, it will become uh, more and more popular. And so for PhD students, just uh, watch it out. Uh, I think University of Oslo, MTNU, those universities also, I think renewable energy sector where it's hidden. I think in Trondheim, we have a department where the, I, I personally was on the course um, together with another PhD who was doing a research about getting energy kind of to have an object in the water that will be getting an energy from the waves uh, to, uh, and so on. So it's also kind of renewable energy. So try to check it out, something related to this, to water-ish related stuff. But it is, uh, in Norway in general, it's not like many positions available because Norway is small and it's a bit more than 5 million population in total in Norway. So of course, if you compare it to other countries that are larger, you will have much more positions open and so on. But I think for Norway itself, it's quite well, uh, it, it, it at least it's always something available there it just not every single direction it's uh, easy to get in or sometimes internally it's enough people here so that's why externally for to immigrate with some special topics could be really hard eight minutes more let's see i'm trying to so it's not the last time if you like this uh, type of uh, communication. So I will do it more often and I will move it maybe to uh, weekends because now I'm on vacation, so I can do it now on the Thursday, but then we can move it to Sunday, for example, so more people can join us. Uh, for busy recruitment, I told. I think I haven't applied for Canada, Australia, but uh, if to talk about USA, if in USA you have a really, if you have a really good connection with some professors, then uh, you could get a PhD uh, easier there. But if you don't have any connections at all, I think that um, depending on field of study, uh, Norway should be fine. So if you have a good grades, but for me, it's hard to tell because I have never went through the application, PhD application process in other countries. So it's a bit kind of um, to tell something that I have never done. I think it will be not correct from me, mm. but it should be, shouldn't be harder. So the, if you have a really good, uh, grades and uh, you are passionate and you like research and just uh, 
yeah, it's you never know. Sometimes it's many applicants and it's hard to choose, and sometimes it's a few good ones that it's much easier to select uh, candidates. So it's also a, it's kind of a bit about luck, how lucky you are. About uh, education as a discipline in Norway, I think that due to lack of time, I, I need to to cover it in a separate video and I also need to do a bit more uh, rigid preparation for that. So since I went through master, I can talk about master, but if you talk uh, education as a discipline, uh, it's very special because Norwegian culture is special, but uh, uh, it's hard for me to now answer this question. I need to look what is there for the education as a discipline in Norwegian university. It's a bit hard to say if it's something could be there, but it's not often. I don't think that it's like extremely popular topic. If you have a master admission in NTNU and Stavanger, which of the university do you think uh, to choose? Uh, the course is Petroleum Engineering. I would select NTNU because NTNU uh, in Trondheim, most likely you have, it, it will be from there. Uh, it is a very old uh, university that is very proficient in that field of study, but you need to remember that uh, Trondheim is a very rainy city. Um, so if you want to live in a sunny city uh, with uh, better weather and so on, so that's the wonder. But prof like professionally wise, NTNU is the largest Norwegian university. So that's why I would go for it if you received the proposal from there. No, it is uh, if you want to apply on different PhDs at the same department in the university, uh, just apply for their PhDs that are quite similar. If they are completely different, um, uh, I don't think that I would recommend you to select one at a time. But if they are similar, so for instance, on the interview, you can explain that you wanted to do about that and that's why you were interested in this and that. Um, but in Norway, like it doesn't hurt. If you want to apply, apply. Yeah, just uh, if they're completely different, uh, then how can you explain uh, that uh, you are, you have kind of skills to do both, or like you are proficient in two different fields? So this is would be a question because uh, we want to have a proficient person. So select the one that you are more proficient at, that you are really strong at. Uh, about multiple PhDs uh, doctorates, like double, double it's one thing because you do them at the same time at two different universities, but to do more than one PhD uh, in Norway, if you want to live in Norway, it's not good. Even to have multiple masters, it is already challenging. Um, it, it could be hard to find a job afterwards. And many people, uh, of course, I, I don't know that I know. I know people who has a double PhDs, like uh, PhDs from two different universities done at the same time. But I don't know anyone who has more than one PhDs. First, go for, through the first PhD. Uh, and if you completed it, I would recommend you to move further as postdoc, as researcher or associate professor. Apply for associate professor. Don't waste your time for going for one more PhD. Really, like for sure, go for researcher, for postdoc, for associate professor, but don't waste time for another PhD. Because PhD, it's a process kind of, you learn how to be a researcher. After you complete it, you anyway can slowly shift from one direction to another. You don't need to gain one more degree to do that. Uh, what is great about Norway that you can apply for PhD at different uh, age uh, after having a different uh, experiences. If you don't have a PhD, for instance, and even though you worked as an assistant professor, 
of course, it's a great if you go and apply for PhD. Uh, we have some people from uh, uh, from the time when we were Jovic University College, and they didn't have a PhD degree. And after we merged together with Antonio, so this is became a requirement that uh, you actually need to get a PhD degree to to be able to teach uh, masters. Because for bachelor for bachelors, you don't need if you have master's degree. But uh, don't look on your age. I personally, myself, uh, last uh, autumn, I was teaching bachelor students who were, I don't know their age, but they like they were 40 plus and they uh, just were admitted to the bachelor. So they were first year bachelor students. So in Norway, this is what is great. You can go and uh, start studying uh, again uh, uh, for change in your direction, uh, literally at any age you wish. In master classes, it's a different uh, case. Uh, in my class, it was about 20 students. Sometimes you can have less, sometimes you can have more. It depends on the direction of uh, your master. So typically, it's uh, my class was one of the large ones. So we were like 20, 22. Um, so something like that. Thank you very much for uh, uh, for being together with me. I will. I'm answering the last question now, and that's also the question that I'm taking now. It's about uh, accommodation for PhD employees and tenure. Since uh, PhD, it is an employee. You don't get any accommodation from the Norwegian universities. You need to search them. And for this, um, you can use uh, fin.no. I actually have uh, information slightly about that on my video about the uh, cost of living in Norway. So go and watch that video there. I uh, share some insights how to search accommodation in Norway. And in Jovic, you will get a bit cheaper pricing comparing to Trondheim. So this is what is great about Jovic, that it's a bit cheaper, but the salary would be the same in Trondheim and Jovic. So that's why yeah, I love uh, Jovic, because you can save up a bit more money. Then. But it doesn't have that much uh, social life comparing to Trondheim. So there is like pluses and minuses. So that's why yeah, uh, I can say you that for getting accommodation, you need to uh, work it out yourself. Thank you very much for being with me. Uh, if you still have uh, questions and so on, keep it keep them for the next live session or write them in the comments under my videos uh, about different topics. I will be still responding there and I will try to make uh, once in a month such live session so you will have a chance to talk to me about different uh, topics. Thank you very much. Have a nice uh, day time. Uh, I don't know, depending on the time uh, where you are. So um, enjoy your summer and uh, enjoy uh, mid of summer and see you soon. Bye.